Okay, good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to Grand Rounds, and it's a real privilege for, to, for, for me to introduce uh, Dr. John Cook, who certainly to this audience doesn't need a formal introduction. He is the Rusty Walter and Carol Walter Presidential Distinguished Chair in Cardiovascular Disease and Research, Professor of Cardiovascular uh, Sciences. He's the Chair of the Department of Cardiovascular Sciences here at our uh, Research Center and Director of the Center for Cardiovascular Regeneration. Um, extraordinarily well-known on uh, international level, extraordinarily well-published with over 500 um, publications. He's really taken a lead um, at the national level, serving as president of Society for Vascular Medicine, just to name one of the uh, many, many, many accolades. I would like to highlight uh, he, was he did his training in cardiovascular medicine and obtained a uh, PhD um, at Mayo Clinic, and then was recruited uh, to Harvard um, as assistant professor. And, rose to the ranks and was then uh, recruited by Stanford where he spearheaded the vascular biology and, and medicine program and became associate director of the Stanford Cardiovascular Institute. And we were fortunate enough to have him transition here to take the lead uh, in so many ways uh, in 2013. But I, I, I think what you'll see today is his, um, the clinical foundation, his understanding and him, how he is as a just beloved educator really positions him to be one of the, one of the really strong uh, physician champions um, at our program. So Dr. Cook, as always, thank you for, for giving ground rounds and we look forward to your talk on current concepts in peripheral artery disease. Thanks, Jerry. Thank you, thank you. Thanks, Jerry, for that nice introduction. Um, so I have um, a uh, humble gift for you today. It's um, uh, basically what I've done as a physician uh, for uh, the past uh, 30 years. Not so much anymore. I don't have the opportunity to see patients as much as I did uh, when, in, earlier in my career. Uh, but um, peripheral arterial disease is something that I've, uh, I, I, I grew up with as a physician. And I'd like to um, uh, give you some of my learnings from, from taking care of these patients. I've learned a lot from them uh, over the years. And I'd like to uh, uh, impart that uh, to you uh, today. And at the end, I'm going to talk a little bit just uh, about a, a new discovery that's been made in our laboratory that's relevant to peripheral arterial disease. So there's a, another gift at the end uh, for those of you who are more interested in mechanisms. But most of this talk is going to be about medical management of peripheral arterial disease. And uh, if you want to learn more about uh, this disorder, uh, we had a nice compendium in circulation research uh, in 2015. Also, uh, the American College of Cardiology has just updated their recommendations for the management of peripheral arterial disease. And uh, that uh, also the uh, European Society of Cardiology just came out with an opus on um, medical management of, uh, or rather management of uh, peripheral arterial disease. Um, I see some uh, physicians in, in the audience that probably know more about vascular disease than I do. Eric Peden, uh, I hope you uh, uh, chip in with a few comments. And uh, uh, so please, uh, please feel free to, um, to make this a conversation uh, about peripheral arterial disease. I'm going to start out by talking about why we need as a community to do a better job at diagnosing and treating peripheral arterial disease medically. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about the diagnosis and evidence-based treatment. And then at the end, as I said, I'm, I have uh, something new to show you. So what is peripheral vascular disease? Who can tell me what peripheral vascular disease is? It's more than you think. Peripheral vascular disease is really venous, lymphatic, and arterial disease. It's a very broad um, uh, 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 diagnostic category. Now, we're, today we're going to be talking about an arterial disease a non-coronary arterial disease. Now, non-coronary arterial disease also includes aneurysms, AV fistulas, AV malformations, and occlusive arterial disease. That's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about arterial occlusive disease. Now, arterial occlusive disease can come in different flavors, too. You've got carotid, upper extremity, uh, renal, mesenteric. We're going to be talking about aortoiliac, infrainguinal, infrapopliteal arterial occlusive disease today. That disease can be due to many things. It can be due to atherosclerosis, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, but you also have embolism, dissection. We have accidents with catheters, uh, thromboangitis obliterans, thrombophilia, 
trauma vasculitis. So uh, it's more than, peripheral vascular disease is more than this guy holding his calf uh, because of pain uh, due to uh, poor uh, flow to the calf. It's, it's really broad, uh, broad disease. And our focus today, though, will be a non-coronary arterial disease, occlusive, uh, affecting the uh, aortoiliac and uh, vessels below the inguinal ligament uh, due to atherosclerosis. It's a very common disease. A at least 8 to 10 million people in the United States are affected by peripheral arterial disease, most of them undiagnosed. And actually, I'll be talking about the ankle brachial index uh, later, but the, the, uh, if you define peripheral arterial disease by the ankle brachial index, we're missing about 50% uh, of patients with peripheral arterial disease. If you're just using ankle brachial index as it is recommended, I'll talk about that uh, a little bit later. So it's at least 8 to 10 million. I think it's more on the range of 15 million, just as many people that have coronary artery disease uh, in this country. Despite the fact that it is so common, this is a very common disease. It's as common as coronary artery disease, in my opinion. The public awareness of peripheral arterial disease is poor. Uh, this is a nice study by Alan Hirsch uh, that looked into what people know about peripheral arterial disease. And uh, you can see that in the first three columns, uh, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, diabetes, we've done a pretty good job at educating people about those uh, diseases. Um, less so, uh, well, uh, with uh, coronary artery disease, congestive heart failure, and, uh, and peripheral arterial disease, you can see the comparison in the uh, three columns in, in the middle. Uh, and you can see that we've done a pretty good job educating people about coronary artery disease, stroke, and heart failure. But peripheral arterial disease, the awareness of peripheral arterial disease is very poor. Now, that was back in 2007. Uh, this paper actually um, did a lot to, to launch American Heart Association efforts to educate uh, uh, the community about peripheral arterial disease. So if you go on the AHA website now, you can actually see quite a bit about uh, peripheral arterial disease on that website, and there's more effort uh, to um, educate the, the public about peripheral arterial disease. But back in 2007, uh, it, was, uh, it was less known than ALS, for example. ALS was better known than peripheral arterial disease. Um, what about physician awareness of peripheral arterial disease? I think in this group, we're, we're, we're aware of peripheral arterial disease. I think out um, you know, in uh, primary care practices, maybe not so much. So this partner study studied uh, 7,000 outpatients in a primary care setting that were at risk for having peripheral arterial disease. So these are people over the age of 70. It's estimated that about 20% of people over the age of 70 have peripheral arterial disease. 20% of people over the age of 70 have peripheral arterial disease. So they took, they screened patients and coming into, just walking into primary care practices, 7,000 patients over the age of 70, or they're over the age of 50 with another risk factor for peripheral arterial disease, diabetes or uh, smoking. And that was the inclusion criteria for this study. Uh, and the, the whole idea to uh, understand how many of these patients had peripheral arterial disease and were, was it diagnosed? So in this study, once the patients were entered into the study, they had one thing done. They had an ankle brachial index done. They had a short questionnaire related to peripheral arterial disease, the symptoms of peripheral arterial disease. And the um, nurse, uh, nurses that were working on the study went, went through the medical record to see if the diagnosis had been made. What they found was that in this population, people over the age of 70, or people over the age of 50 that are smokers or diabetic, over 25% of people had a low ankle brachial index, meaning under 0 0.9. And so they had peripheral arterial disease by ABI. Um, of those that had peripheral arterial disease, less than half were diagnosed. Actually, that's, that's probably uh, better uh, than uh, uh, than, than in, in some other situations, including uh, the Stanford Cath Lab, because we did a study in, in, there in the Stanford Cath Lab to see of those patients that were coming to uh, angiography, how many had peripheral arterial disease and how many were diagnosed. 20% uh, of our patients going to uh, diagnostic catheterization uh, at uh, Stanford or at Mount Sinai uh, 
uh, had uh, peripheral arterial disease by ABI, and only a third were diagnosed. And, and that's important. Why is that important? I mean, if you have someone with peripheral arterial disease, you don't want to be putting a catheter in their femoral artery if you can avoid it. You'd uh, might be much better off putting the catheter uh, in the radial artery using that approach. Anyway, it's, uh, the point is, is that we have to do a better job at diagnosing this disease. And uh, I'll, I'll show you the simple tool that you can use in just a moment. The other thing that was, as you can imagine, if you're not making the diagnosis, these individuals who are at risk for heart attack and stroke and, and who are at every bit of risk of, of having a major adverse cardiovascular event as someone with coronary disease, they were less likely to be treated with antiplatelet agents, statins, and hypertensives. So we uh, need to do a, a better job at uh, finding them. Because this disease is not benign. This disease is not benign. Um, this is a nice uh, study by uh, Creaky, Michael Creaky, an epidemiologist in San Diego who's been doing this for years, been studying patients with peripheral arterial disease. And these data that I'm showing you, these data have been confirmed by subsequent studies, uh, but this was the first, uh, showing us that uh, there's a, 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 that PAD, having a low ankle breaking index, having a, a low pressure in your ankle because of arterial occlusive disease, is a risk factor. In fact, it is a uh, a separate uh, and distinct risk factor from the Framingham risk factors. It adds to the predictive uh, value of the pr uh, Framingham factors. It's an independent risk factor, having a low ankle brachial index. So if you follow normal individuals over the age of 60 for 10 years, some of them will pass away. Here's, here's what happens with uh, normal individuals. Start, they're starting out at the study, they're about 60 years old, and they're being followed over time, and, and some of them are, are passing away. If you have severe peripheral arterial disease, this is worse than most cancers in terms of your risk of death. Uh, at the, at, uh, if you have severe symptomatic peripheral arterial disease, after 10 years, only 25% of those individuals are still with us. But here's the thing. Even if you have asymptomatic peripheral arterial disease, you're not having any symptoms. Maybe because you're too sedentary, or maybe because the doctor thought it was arthritis or something else. If you have, if the diagnosis hasn't been made, uh, your risk of having, um, uh, uh, have, having a myocardial infarction or stroke and succumbing over a 10 year period is pretty high. Uh, so this is why we need to uh, recognize the disease and then institute the proper treatment. Why is that? Why do these patients have such a bad outcome? Well, this picture says it all. Uh, patients with peripheral arterial disease have a form of atherosclerosis that is disseminated and that is aggressive. Uh, these individuals typically have disease in other circulations. They have coronary artery disease. They have carotid artery disease. They have mesenteric arterial disease. They may have an aortic aneurysm. And uh, all of those things can be associated with um, significant morbidity and mortality. Okay, so how do we recognize this disease so that we can treat the patients? Well, uh, let's talk about symptoms for a minute. Um, who can tell me what, what symptoms do these patients typically have? Patient with peripheral arterial disease. Walking into your office, that's a clue. Um, <laughs> They're having pain with walking, right? They're, they're complaining of, of pain in their calf or their thigh uh, with walking. Sometimes it's just a, a burning or sometimes it's a fatigue that they'll describe. But they, they have these uh, lower extremity symptoms in the calf, thigh, or buttocks. And the, and the big clue that it's peripheral arterial disease is that it goes away when they stand still. So let's say a woman comes into your office with pain in her legs with walking. Um, you ask her to th put, a, put, put this into context of a scenario. She's in the grocery store. She's pushing a grocery cart. Um, does she get the pain she, while she's walking? Yes. Okay, if you stop the grocery cart and you just stand there for a minute, does it go away? Yes. Well, that's probably peripheral arterial disease. No. Well, it might be something else. If she's still having pain while she's standing, leg pain. While she's standing up, what's that problem most likely? 
some sort of spinal stenosis, right? Some sort of uh, 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 neuromuscular problem. So that's, those are some simple things that you can ask to detect the disease. But those classic symptoms are only present in a minority of patients. Only 10 to 30 percent of people will tell you that they have peripheral arteriosis. We'll, we'll give you those clues. So we really have to look for it. We really have to look for it because most patients ha are, quote, asymptomatic because they're highly sedentary. That's a risk factor for peripheral arterial disease, being sedentary. Or they have atypical symptoms, or they, they're older people. They also have a problem with their knee. They have a, a problem with their back. Uh, they have other issues that can confuse the uh, diagnostic uh, picture. There are some other things you can do on examination. You can, uh, if you, first of all, you do a careful pulse examination. You look for, uh, feel the infrainguinal pulses, uh, femoral, popliteal, uh, and the dorsalis pedis, posterior tibial pulses. So actually, it's important to get, try to get behind the knee and feel the popliteal pulse. I mean, why, why bother to do that? I mean, you could just feel the pedal pulses, right? You just feel the dorsalis pedis or the posterior tibial. No, it's actually important to try to feel the popliteal because that's the only way you're going to find an aneurysm uh, on your examination, popliteal aneurysm. These, these patients do have a risk uh, for having a popliteal aneurysm. And if they have a popliteal aneurysm, there's a 50% chance that they have an aortic aneurysm as well. So it's important to, to do a complete pulse examination. I have, when I have patients uh, lying flat uh, on the, the, on the uh, gurney on the bed uh, and I ask them, uh, I'm feeling a, the pulse examination, then I also raise the legs up and uh, look for elevation pallor, which you can see uh, in this picture. Um, that's pretty specific for peripheral arterial disease. And then you put their feet down and you'll see dependent ruber. So the elevation pallor is because the pressure at the ankle is so low, you just lift that foot up and, and, and gravity is enough to prevent the flow of blood to the foot. Then now the foot's getting ischemic, you put it down and you get this dependent rubor and that's due to um, a, um, a, a microvascular dilatation. The, the microvasculature is, is, is doing its best to respond to ischemia. And we're going to talk about that later. That's, that's, uh, there's a discovery that we've made in the laboratory that's related to microvascular response to ischemia. But this, that dependent rubor is a microvascular response to ischemia. The, the, the vessels are opening up wide. That includes the uh, microvessels and uh, uh, the, uh, the microvenules. And you get this kind of picture. Okay, so um, Mark Garvey's here, um, who is uh, exploring, um, doing some great work in computational surgery. Uh, so he's always dealing with equations. And he asked me, will we be looking at any equations today, John? And uh, I'm sorry, Mark, this is the only equation that I have for you. It's the ankle brachial index. The ankle brachial index uh, is uh, basically the pressure at the ankle, uh, which you derive with a Doppler, uh, and uh, the pressure at the uh, arm, also derived using the Doppler, so you have a consistent uh, approach. By the way, do, why do we have to use a Doppler? We're using a, 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 pressure, a, a blood pressure cuff, why don't we use, just use a stethoscope at the ankle? Because it doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work um, because in the arm, um, you're able to take a blood pressure because of what physical phenomenon? The Karatkov sounds, right? The, the, the blood pressure, what you're hearing when you're listening, when you're detecting the, the blood pressure in the arm, is hearing the Karatkov sounds. It's basically, as you release the pressure in the cuff, some blood is starting to get through uh, that, that uh, through, through the cuff and uh, through the artery, and it causes turbulence in the artery uh, that causes the walls to vibrate of the artery. And that's what's making the crack cough sounds. It's actually the turbulent flow that you're inducing with that blood pressure cuff. You cut off the flow completely with, with uh, uh, suprasystolic pressure. You start to release the, the pressure. Blood starts to flow into the brachial artery and causes some turbulence initially. Uh, because of the high stream jet that's just basically uh, getting past that uh, occlusive pressure of the cuff. Well, in the leg, the, vi the walls don't vibrate, even in, in a normal individual, because after years of standing upright, um, there is some fibrosis, some adventitial fibrosis in the 
uh, pedal arteries, so they don't vibrate as much. You can't get carotid cough sounds. So that's why I can't use a, a blood pressure cuff. You actually have to use uh, the uh, Doppler to, to, to assess flow in the vessel. So you gradually release the uh, uh, pressure, and, and you, you, the uh, arterial systolic pressure is when you first hear that uh, Doppler flow. That's the ankle systolic pressure. You express that over the brachial systolic pressure. And Mark, here's, here's your chance to, to, to solve an equation. What should the ABI equal in a normal individual? Ankle pressure over brachial pressure. One. Exactly. I knew you were the guy to answer that equation. OK, uh, it should be 1 to 1.2. Actually, the systolic pressure, the systolic pressure can actually be a little bit higher at the ankle because of pulse wave reflections in a normal individual. The mean arterial pressure is the same, but the systolic pressure actually that you're detecting can be actually be higher than the brachial systolic pressure because of pulse wave reflections. The leg is a lot longer than the arm, and you have uh, the opportunity for uh, pulse wave amplification. Um, all right, so that's the ankle brachial index, and it's an important measurement. It's a vital sign. It's a vital sign because it is independently predictive of the risk of that patient of dying from a major adverse cardiovascular event, independently predictive of the Framingham risk factors. So we talked about this. This is a, the normal ankle brachial index is somewhere between 1 and 1 1.4. Um, 0.9 is where we say someone has peripheral arterial disease by convention. And uh, this, you'll see in the panel there, it says take the lowest ankle pressure, I'm sorry, um, for, for the diagnosis of, of uh, peripheral arterial disease, you take the highest ankle pressure and divide it by uh, the uh, brachial pressure. Now this is interesting, I just noticed this now, this is from the European Society of Cardiology, because it had been, you take the, the highest ankle pressure um, uh, in, in the uh, uh, ankle, at the ankle to, to calculate the ankle brachial index, uh, but I believe it should be the lowest. By, by, by convention, it's been the highest. And uh, the, the problem there is that uh, if someone comes in uh, to the cath lab and they have one vessel disease in, in their, uh, one vessel coronary artery disease, you wouldn't say that they don't have coronary artery disease. But that's actually what we do with peripheral arterial disease. Most people, when they're measuring the ankle brachial index, if you have one vessel that is giving you, either posterior tibial or the uh, dorsalis pedis, that's giving you a normal pressure, then that person doesn't have peripheral arterial disease. That really doesn't make sense, and we should be taking the lowest of the ankle pressures uh, to calculate uh, uh, the, uh, whether someone has peripheral arterial disease, because if they have one vessel disease, they still have the same risk uh, of having a, a major adverse cardiovascular event. We, uh, we can do this uh, up and down uh, the legs and, and uh, calculate the pressure drop at different points, segmental pressure measurements, and that can give you some idea where the lesion is in the leg. Where's the pressure drop? Is it at the femoral artery? Is it at the superficial femoral artery? Is it the popliteal artery or below? Uh, this was uh, commonly used in the past. Now it's been largely replaced by duplex ultrasonography because uh, duplex uh, ultrasonography can quickly give you cross-sectional images of the vessel, you get flow velocity, and you can localize where the lesion is, and that's useful if you're planning uh, an interventional procedure. Now, the other imaging that needs to be considered, uh, or the other testing that needs to be considered, is to look for disease in other circulations. Uh, so, uh, a CT for coronary calcium, um, uh, carotid uh, duplex ultrasonography, are things you probably want to do at, at least once in someone that you make the diagnosis of peripheral arterial disease, see what kind of disease they have elsewhere. And then what you find will determine how you manage that individual. Now, I'm going to be just talking about uh, medical management of peripheral arterial disease. And this basically in a slide uh, shows you the approach to peripheral arterial disease as a, a medical doc. You want to do two things. You want to reduce the risk of having a major adverse cardiovascular event, and you want to relieve their symptoms. So um, one of the things that I recommend to my patients is a Mediterranean diet. If they have any coronary, uh, any peripheral arterial disease, uh, I think that has the, the best data, evidence-based data for uh, a diet, Start going back to the Longilles study, um, the diet heart study of Lyon. Um, where a Mediterranean diet was actually more effective at reducing major adverse cardiovascular events than American Heart Association diet. 
We want to get the LDL cholesterol uh, under 70. Uh, the, uh, the, the, it's, it should be less than 70. Blood pressure in the normal tensive range. Uh, and um, the glycosylated, uh, um, the A1C down to 6.5%. And we got them to, you have to get people to stop smoking. Antiplatelet agents, a little bit of difference here from coronary disease. Aspirin has not been shown to be effective in patients with PAD. Uh, there's just not good data for, for aspirin. The data is, is better for clopidogrel. Uh, I'll show you some of that data in a moment. Uh, and then for relieving symptoms, actually the best thing we have is a good supervised exercise program. The pharmacotherapy for symptoms is not very good. Uh, Trentol, I think, is uh, worthless. Celastazole improves walking distance, maybe 30%. Um, a good supervised exercise program can improve walking distance um, by 100%, can double the patient's walking distance, much better than any drug therapy that we have currently. And then intervention, I'm not going to be talking about today, but uh, maybe Eric will say a few words about it. Um, intervention in a minority of these individuals, and I'll talk about when you make that referral to Eric. Um, ACE inhibitors, I mean, a little bit of data here to show you, um, uh, to support what I just said. ACE inhibitors reduce mortality in peripheral arterial disease. Most of the work in peripheral arterial disease are sub-studies of large trials for coronary artery disease. Um, but in the HOPE study, those patients that had peripheral arterial disease were benefited by ACE inhibitors to the same degree as everybody else. And the story is the same with statins. Statins also reduce the risk of major adverse cardiovascular events in patients with peripheral arterial disease. This is data from the heart protection study. The other thing about statins that you might not know is they increase walking distance. They're actually better than Trentol. Uh, and, and improving walking distance. Um, and that, this study done by uh, Emil Moeller, published in Circulation a few years ago, has been confirmed by other studies showing that statins, uh, st uh, good uh, statin therapy can improve walking distance in patients with peripheral arterial disease. Um, this uh, is uh, the best study uh, for antiplatelet agents in peripheral arterial disease, uh, the Capri study. Uh, I think uh, 5,000 patients uh, that had a history of a stroke or MI or peripheral arterial disease were enrolled in, into the study. Actually, it was 15,000 patients. It was about 5,000 in each of those groups and uh, randomized to aspirin or clopidogrel. And uh, uh, the patients with peripheral arterial disease had the greatest benefit from clopidogrel. Um, the other patients with a history of MI or stroke uh, had equal benefit of uh, aspirin and uh, clopidogrel. So, for PAD, we, we uh, recommend that uh, patients use clopidogrel as an antiplatelet therapy. Uh, there's been concern raised about using beta blockers in peripheral arterial disease. Uh, of course, um, uh, the sympathetic nervous system, uh, 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 the uh, uh, beta adrenergic receptors uh, cause vasodilation in the, in the periphery. So why block those? Um, there's been concern about using beta blockers in peripheral arterial disease. I think in patients with critical limb ischemia, we're still a little bit reluctant to use beta blockers, but in the average person with intermittent claudication, it's not a problem. There's a lot of good reasons to put people on a beta blocker for their heart, and uh, patients with peripheral arterial disease can tolerate a beta blocker without a problem in terms of their walking distances un unimpaired by a beta blocker. This is a nice uh, summary by uh, Heather Gornick and Mark Krieger. Uh, showing the benefit of uh, various therapies uh, for peripheral arterial disease. It was a, a nice uh, review of the literature. And, uh, and again, showing what I just showed you, is, and that is statins, beta blockers. Uh, in this case, they were looking at aspirin, uh, 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 but uh, as I mentioned, clopidogrel is better, uh, and ACE inhibitors. Uh, are all uh, useful uh, therapies for these patients with peripheral arterial disease. And virtually every patient with PAD should be on uh, all of those. Uh, therapies because they have vasoprotective effects. Now, uh, let's talk about treating symptoms. Our medical management of symptoms is suboptimal. Um, as I mentioned, Trentol is of questionable benefit. Um, Pletol, Celastazole, uh, 100 milligrams twice a day uh, can improve walking distance about 30 percent. Here's the data. Uh, actually, there's been, uh, for Celastazole's approval, there were six separate trials. And uh, you can see that celastazole there in, in the darker color, red, uh, uh, by comparison to pentoxifilin or placebo uh, over time uh, showed an improvement. 
uh, in uh, walking distance. Patients uh, had a significant improvement in their maximal walking distance on a treadmill. And uh, you notice that pentoxiflin wasn't much better than placebo. Uh, pentoxiflin wouldn't be approved today uh, um, based on uh, the evidence, uh, but it already had FDA approval uh, uh, years ago, so it's still used, uh, and as I said, of questionable benefit. The best way to improve a person's walking distance, and in fact, there's good data from the CLEVER study that it's as good as angioplasty uh, as, su as supervised exercise. So supervised exercise is about as good as an interventional procedure in terms of improving walking distance. Um, this is um, uh, some work by uh, Gardner, who's been uh, one of the major leaders in, uh, in studying supervised exercise for patients with peripheral arterial disease. And this basically shows you that uh, you get you know, a 2x improvement in walking distance uh, with a good um, exercise program. ICD is intermittent claudication distance, is the point at which a person develops claudication. ACD is absolute claudication distance, that's as far as they can go. Um, and before they have to stop. So s people can walk into their claudication, they can have symptoms and continue to walk through the symptoms, uh, but at some point they stop, that's the ACD. And uh, both the point at which a person develops symptoms and the point at which they have to stop walking uh, are improved, both of those distances are improved by a good supervised exercise program. Now, um, if you don't have a supervised exercise program, actually, and, and we do, we have one for our coronary patients, and you can probably get uh, insert uh, your PAD patients into that program because they likely have coronary artery disease. Uh, if you don't have a supervised exercise program, how does home-based therapy work? Um, the data is mixed. Home-based therapy doesn't seem to work quite as well uh, in some studies. Uh, I think uh, if, if you have some uh, frequent calls to the patients, if you have some nurse involvement, uh, it, can, it, can improve, it can work. But here's the problem, I mean, uh, patients have difficulty following your exercise recommendations. And, um, you know, I, I have this problem myself. You get, get home from work, you know, you're tired, don't feel like going out and exercising. Um, so it is a problem that to, a supervised exercise program is much better. So I'm coming to the end of my comments about medical management of peripheral arterial disease. Um, but I do want to make uh, one comment about when you should send your patient to uh, Eric Peden or uh, Alan Lumsden. Um, and, and the three indications for sending a patient with peripheral arterial disease to, to Alan uh, or to Eric is lifestyle limiting claudication. You've put this person on medication, they're, they're on maximal therapy, uh, they are on an exercise program and their lifestyle is still impaired. They're a postman, they can't make their rounds, uh, or they want to golf and they can't do it, they can't go nine holes. So um, that's an indication, it's a soft indication. Um, a more, a much stronger indication is shown uh, on, the, on the picture below. That's a uh, non-healing ulcer uh, on the, in the calcaneal region, the heel, and that person uh, needs quickly to get an angiogram done, an, an intervention plan. Uh, because that, in a patient with peripheral arterial disease, that ulcer can lead to gangrene and loss of the limb. Someone with rest pain uh, also is, and that's an indication for going to, um, to see the interventionalist. Does anyone know what rest pain is? Can, can you describe rest pain for me? Pain at rest. Well, it's pain at rest, right? But where is it? It's not in the calf. It's not in the, the thigh. It's in the foot. A person will wake up in the middle of the night and their foot will be aching. It's like a toothache. And the only way that they can get relief is by dangling their leg uh, on the edge of the bed. The, the force of gravity is just enough to get a few red blood cells down to the uh, foot and relieve the ischemia that they're having when they're lying flat. They actually need, someone with rest pain actually needs the force of gravity to get blood, enough blood flow down to the foot uh, to relieve their pain. It can get confusing, too, because some people will say, well, I get up and I walk around and I feel better. That's kind of confusing. That, why, why would walking around make them feel better? Well, they're really not walking. They're kind of shuffling a little bit and they're going very slowly. And the force of gravity is getting enough blood flow down to that uh, foot so they're getting some relief. They, they need to be seeing Alan soon. So in summary, uh, in terms of uh, our medical therapy, we can actually do a lot for patients with peripheral 
arterial disease, as internists, as uh, vascular medicine docs. Uh, you want to modify the risk factors. We talked about that. Antiplatelet therapy, a little bit different than the C CAD patients. Clopidogrel is superior. Uh, pharmacotherapy, don't even bother with Trentol. It's, it's, uh, it's not going to help them much. Uh, Pletol is useful, uh, but an exercise is much better and a supervised exercise program is, is superior. There's some evidence that home-based program with some encouragement can also work um, and intervention in, in a, a minority. Now, in the time that I have left, Jerry, have what, 15, 10, 15? 15? Yeah, I, I'm gonna try to get through this in, in less than 10 minutes um, because I'd like to have some questions. I'd like to have your thoughts. I'd like to hear what Eric and, and the others have to say. Um, one thing we don't understand uh, well, there's a lot that we don't understand about peripheral arterial disease. But one of the things that we don't understand are what causes it to progress. I have had patients with an ankle brachial index of 0 0.5. That's moderate peripheral arterial disease to severe, moderate to severe. And they're limited by claudication. I have had other patients with an ankle brachial index of 0 0.5. They have an ischemic ulcer. Their foot's in danger. They're having rest pain. They have to go to intervention. Um, so why is it that two people that are hemodynamically similar um, have different outcomes? So uh, ABI, as I mentioned, is an independent risk factor for mortality. But here's the thing. It's only weakly predictive of how far that person can walk on a treadmill. We've shown that. It's also only weakly predictive of progression. So there must be something else going on besides the vascular disease in the large arteries besides the disease in the conduit vessels. Here's a hypothesis. Maybe it's not just uh, uh, disease in the conduit vessels. Maybe there's also some disease going on in the microvasculature. And I see Deepan Shah here, and maybe Deepan can comment on this because he's been studying it uh, with uh, MR imaging. He's been studying uh, the microvasculature in peripheral arterial disease. And, and I think there, there's some good evidence to support this. And I don't have time to go uh, into it in great detail. But I'd like to talk just briefly about something we've found in the laboratory, something new, something exciting, and it deals with this issue of the microvasculature in peripheral arterial disease. Turns out that in response to limb ischemia, there is a regenerative response. Uh, it probably doesn't surprise you uh, very much, but, but the, um, the regenerative response that we're finding now uh, is, um, uh, includes this phenomenon that we've discovered in the laboratory in our mouse model of peripheral arterial disease. Of course, you have to confirm this in human, but we actually have some human data that this phenomenon occurs. Uh, that uh, in, with the uh, uh, injury of hypoxia uh, and ischemic ischemia, uh, you have uh, trigger a series of events that leads fibroblasts in the tissue to become endothelial cells. This is a normal response, I believe, to ischemia, this transdifferentiation of fibroblasts to endothelial cells and an expansion of the microvasculature in the limb that is ischemic. So Shu Meng has done most of the work on this project. She's pictured in this slide. And this, uh, this I guess the main message that I'm going to leave you with is that cell fate is not fixed. Cell fate is fluid. And if you understand the mechanisms, uh, for that fluidity, maybe you can manipulate those in a therapeutic way. That's where the direction we're heading. And um, it comes from work that I did at Stanford um, in uh, 2012. We published this paper in Cell that described this phenomenon of transformation. Again, cell fate is not fluid, um, and there are mechanisms for cells to change their phenotype in response to a challenge. So the big idea here is that any cellular challenge will activate uh, pathways actually that are well described, these activation of innate immune pathways, innate immune pathways that lead to uh, changes in transcriptional activators, uh, that's the third panel, uh, that uh, open up the chrominin. That open up the chrominin, increase DNA accessibility to other transcriptional factors. And what that does is it allows the cell to reach back into its genetic toolbox and pull out whatever it needs to survive or adapt. So, we found that any cellular challenge, uh, it, it can be pathogens, it can be damage, they present molecular patterns to the cell. Pathogen-associated molecular patterns, damage-associated molecular patterns. We have receptors on our cells for those things, for those challenges, toll-like receptors. 
uh, receptor for advanced glycosylation end products. These receptors can sense damage, can sense pathogens, trigger this innate immune signaling pathway that leads to the release of inflammatory cytokines. That's all well known. What we've shown is that you get changes in epigenetic modifiers that opens up the DNA uh, for greater accessibility. Now that we know that to be true, we can take advantage of that phenomenon and change cells uh, in a therapeutic manner. And what we've, been, what we've done is we've been able to take human fibroblasts and change them into endothelial cells. And we've been able to show in our animal model of peripheral arterial disease that, that has a therapeutic effect. So this was published a couple years ago, uh, our transdifferentiation of human fibroblast endothelial cells. And uh, initially we did this in vitro by manipulating the pathways I just showed you. Uh, but now we're doing it in vivo. Shu's uh, actually uh, done this in our, our model of murine peripheral arterial disease, where we tie off the femoral artery and subject the limb to ischemia. Um, and I won't go into a lot of the details, but um, take a look at panel G. Uh, those are, uh, that's a typical uh, response of endothelial cells when you put them into matrigel in, in vitro. They form capillaries. They're trying to form capillaries. They form these vascular networks. But these were not authentic endothelial cells that you're looking at. These are, are induced endothelial cells. These, are, these used to be fibroblasts that were uh, uh, changed into endothelial cells using the uh, manipulation of uh, the pathways that I just showed you. And again, I don't have time to go into detail. I just want to give you a, a, an idea of what we're doing in the laboratory. And we do use this model of peripheral arterial disease in our mice, uh, we can inject these cells into the hind limb and show that they can improve perfusion. Um, and the idea ultimately is, is for therapeutic transdifferentiation, for, for changing a cell into another cell type, is to do this in a therapeutic way so that we can uh, change fibroblasts, for example, into endothelial cells to improve blood flow in an ischemic tissue or to uh, halt a fibrosing disease. We're learning a lot more about the mechanisms uh, involved uh, in uh, this. Uh, this is another paper from Circulation Research last year published by Shu and our group. Um, we're, we're learning more about the mechanisms involved in the transdifferentiation. And um, uh, uh, again, I can't go into a lot of detail at this moment, but uh, the point is, is that uh, the, these mechanisms increase DNA accessibility uh, so that the cell has, cell's fate is more fluid. Now, the thing we just discovered in the laboratory that uh, I'm, I'm mentioning to you, and this is for the first time, uh, is this uh, phenomenon of angiogenic transdifferentiation. We've been doing, we've been changing fibroblasts into endothelial cells in vitro. We want to do it in vivo, but first we want to see, you know, what happens if we don't provide our cocktail, our transdifferentiation cocktail. And what Shu learned is that this phenomenon of fibroblast endothelial cell transdifferentiation occurs normally uh, when a tissue, when a, when a limb is subjected to ischemia. And uh, we're working on this project right now. I don't know if she was here, but uh, we, we're understanding this process. We want to uh, really understand the mechanisms and manipulate those mechanisms uh, so that we can uh, improve uh, therapies for peripheral arterial disease. So I'm going to end with that uh, hopeful thought and then show you the group that's been helping me uh, do all these great things in the laboratory. And I think there's a few minutes left for questions and happy to talk about this or happy to talk about peripheral arterial disease and love to hear what Eric has to say and uh, the others uh, that uh, deal with these patients uh, day in, day out, deep, deep on, like love to hear your thoughts about imaging and, and patients with peripheral arterial disease. Thank you all for your attention. John, um, th thank you for that just fantastic overview and for linking clinical problems, getting back into the basic. Very exciting work, and let's just jump right into questions. Imad. Doug, this is an excellent presentation. Um, just had one question. Is there any data out there with chronic inflammation driven by comorbidities and microvascular rarefaction in peripheral arterial disease? Is, is there any data to support this kind of an etiological process? There's, there's a fair amount of data to suggest that uh, excessive inflammation is present in patients with peripheral arterial disease. They're circulating uh, inflammatory cytokines, for example. And now there's some, from, some data with uh, this new IL-1 beta antagonist, uh, canakinumab. Um, 
I might be mispronouncing it, but it's a new, it's a new antagonist uh, of, of IL-1 beta, the infl one inflammatory pathway. That, that antagonist has been shown, as you know, to reduce major adverse cardiovascular events. And uh, now there's some, uh, a little bit of evidence that it might ask, actually be useful in peripheral arterial disease, too. There were some patients with PAD in that study. Uh, there's a, uh, my understanding is that a subset analysis of the PAD patients sh showed that there was benefit of that anti-inflammatory in the patients with peripheral arterial disease. Um, there's, there's a Goldilocks zone for inflammation. I think we all understand that as physicians. You need some amount of inflammatory signaling uh, for regeneration. So if you have a patient with um, an injury, an ulcer, uh, a foot ulcer, or a wound after surgery, and that person is on steroids, we know that they don't heal very well. Um, in, this, in our models, uh, steroids suppress this angiogenic transdifferentiation. We also know that if you have too much inflammation, that can also impair regeneration. So uh, uh, Eric can tell you, when he sees a patient with diabetic foot ulcer, there's typically a ring of inflammation around that foot ulcer. It's called fixed inflammation. And that is associated with non-healing. Those lesions don't heal. Well, in our models, if we excessively activate inflammation in, 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 our, in this, this, our PAD model. We don't see this phenomenon. This phenomenon is an impaired. So there's a Goldilocks zone for inflammatory signaling that's important. And one of the concerns I have with these new these new, this new direction in our field, cardiovascular field, of treating inflammation is we could have some problems, unanticipated uh, effects, particularly if someone's going to surgery on one of these IL-1 beta antagonists. It might be a problem to suppress inflammation too much. So, you know, I'd say on the vascular surgery or vascular interventional side, probably our biggest job is restraining ourselves, right? That not every blocked artery needs to be fixed, and that's one of the real challenges. And I think that, you know, if it's critical limb ischemia, a person's going to lose their limb, obviously that's something we need to be aggressive about. But many times for us, it's kind of backing up and saying, whoa, this person has real problems and they need to get in with the right specialist to help manage these things, right? Because so many of the patients we see are not on statins, are still smoking, their A1C is out of control. Blood pressure is 220. I mean, just the litany of things is crazy. Um, so, so uh, angiogenesis, cell and gene driven, why haven't we seen any real movement in that? And is there something you think on the horizon that's going to move forward? Yeah, that's a great point, Eric. Uh, Eric's referring to all the failures that we've had with angiogenic therapies. Uh, we've tried everything, VEGF, FGF, uh, HGF. Uh, I was involved in the WALK study where we, we used uh, uh, HIF-1-alpha. Uh, it was basically a uh, retro, uh, no, it was a, a viral activation of uh, HIF-1-alpha. That should have triggered all of the uh, 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 hypoxic responses. I, that, was, that failed too. Our cell therapies, injecting cells into ischemic tissue, don't seem to be working very well. There's over 50 studies in peripheral arterial disease of injecting bone marrow derived mononuclear cells or adipose derived uh, mesenchymal stem cells. Uh, you know, some promising initial results, but the large trials have all been negative uh, to date. I think to answer your question, Eric, is I think we still have a lot more to learn about regenerative medicine for peripheral arterial disease. So that's one of the things we're trying to do. We're trying to understand a little bit more about the mechanisms involved. And I think having that understanding might be able to allow us to therapeutically manipulate angiogenesis. John, a question on medical management. Um, why do some vasodilators work and others don't? I mm -hmm. mean, in your list of nice comparing you know, various drugs, Celostos works. Mm -hmm while the calcium channel blockers don't, because obviously there is a component of large vessel and small vessel disease in these. Mm -hmm. So your thoughts on that? Uh, Bill's question is a great question. And, and it's why, why our vasodilators generally don't work in peripheral arterial disease. Mark Krieger at Harvard did a nice study where he looked at uh, the conduit vessels in patients with peripheral arterial disease, their responsiveness to vasodilators. They don't. They don't respond. Uh, they're like pipes. They're like, they just have very little vasoreactivity. Whereas in the coronaries, typically you'll have a lesion that's eccentric and there's some rim of vascular smooth muscle that you can still have an effect on with your nitrate therapy or your vasodilator therapy. Vasodilators as, per se are vasodilatation as a mechanism for treating conduit vessel disease in the peripheral, uh, in the peripheral circulation doesn't work. Um, that being said, 
Celestazole is an example of something that causes vasodilation that improves walking distance in patients with peripheral arterial disease. Is it platelet-related? I think it's platelet-related. I don't think it has anything to do with its effect on the vascular small muscle. Good question. Thank you. And John, a nice talk. But one of the things that I think I've seen over the years, I don't know if it's a known phenomenon, and if it is, maybe you have an explanation, is the remarkable symmetry of peripheral arterial disease, one leg and the other leg, that an occluded anterior tibial in one leg, chances are it's occluded or at least severely diseased on the other leg. Is that real or my imagination? And if it is real, mm -hmm. do you have an explanation for it? <laughs> yeah, that's, that, that is a great question, Al. Uh, generally, if, if someone has peripheral arterial disease in one leg, they have it in the other leg as well. Yeah, but I'm not talking about this general disease. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about specific lesions yeah. or where the disease is most, which vessel it's most, most yeah. uh, diseased. And, and it seems to be very yeah. symmetrical. You know, I've probably looked at it with a different eye than you have because I, I, I've, you know, we're always looking at what, what lesions to intervene on, and, and there there's some asymmetry in terms of what lesions you want to intervene on. Eric, do you want to say something about that? There, there, there's, there's some symmetry, but there's also a lot of heterogeneity in, in the distribution of plaque. Uh, any thoughts on that? I might jump in here as well, because in the MR lab where we see a lot of these patients and we look at their anatomy, what Al's saying is, is right on. I mean, I see this quite frequently, that, that there's some symmetry to the way that they have disease. And I don't know if maybe it has to do with just the, anat the way the anatomy is that predisposes to lesions at certain locations, and that's symmetric. So there's some component, I wonder, that's, that has to do with just the geometry of the way these vessels are in different people. Yeah. Um, because I've noticed that same phenomenon as well. Mm -hmm. As we look at MR studies on patients, and we look at their lower extremity arterial system, is that there's, there's a surprising amount of symmetry uh, where they have lesions on both sides. And, mm -hmm. and the lesions look very similar on one side and the other. Yeah. And Eric, I mean. Yeah, clearly that's a phenomenon. Why that is, I don't know, but clearly that's the case. And I think, you know, what Deepan just said was, is possibly a clue. Um, that at Ben's branches of bifurcations, of course, you have disturbed flow. And there's a lot of reasons that disturbed flow can <laughs> cause lesions to form. And um, uh, you have uh, actually an impairment of the endothelial lining uh, with just with disturbed flow. And then, of course, you have more contact of uh, lipoproteins and monocytes in those areas of recirculation. And uh, so lesions tend to form at Ben's branches of bifurcation. So I don't know if that, that answers your question, but that might be one, a partial uh, explanation uh, of that phenomenon. Question in the back. Dr. Cook, fascinating talk. Uh, uh, do you think that you know our clinical phenotypes of peripheral vascular disease will change with time? With you know, in terms of looking at you know each patient, where is he in from a vascular inflammation standpoint? Where is he from a proliferation standpoint, or you know fibrosis to actually maybe even define these better so that you know in terms of doing clinical trials with whether it's you know these uh, vascular proliferating agents or, or otherwise, you can actually target better. And now we just put everybody in one, uh, one big basket. Yeah, wow, that's a great comment. Um, because uh, patients with PAD are a heterogeneous lot. A uh, couple other things that I didn't even mention, but, and, and Deepan can tell you this, peripheral arterial disease is more than just a, a disease of the conduit vessels. It's more than just a disease of the microvasculature as well. Um, uh, Mary McDermott in, Mary McDermott in uh, Northwestern has done a lot of work looking at the strength in, in these leg strength in these people. They, have, they lose leg strength. They, and and, and Deep can tell, Deepan can tell you that on MR, they've lost skeletal muscle. And in fact, they've replaced their skeletal muscle in, in, in some part by fat and fibrous tissue. There's a fibro fatty uh, uh, transformation that occurs in the patients with peripheral arterial disease. They lose skeletal muscle. That's a really malignant form of transdifferentiation. It's transdifferentiation from skeletal muscle to fibroblasts to fat. Uh, I believe that's, that, that, that's a, it's a, that transdifferentiation, a pathological transdifferentiation, explains uh, that phenomenon that Mary McDermott noticed, that these people have probable problems walking because of strength. They've lost muscle. Deepan, do you want to say a word about that, about the um, what you see on your MR. Yeah. No, and, and I think, you know, 
give kudos to Gerd Bruner, who has really done a lot of this stuff, uh, you know, from the limit data set, uh, where they've really noticed that there is definitely a relationship when in those people who have significant uh, impairment in blood flow, that they begin to lose skeletal muscle, and so their their muscle mass actually starts to decline. And it's, it's not just a kind of a global phenomenon either. It's certain muscle groups that tend to be more predisposed than others. So, I mean, I think this is something that we're still learning more about. Um, but I think that, yeah, there's clearly kind of this malignant form where you have kind of end organ manifestations just as you do in other organs as well. And then the other comment I'll, I'll make, um, again, is, is kind of getting to some of the stuff that we've been doing looking at microvascular perfusion. And we've noticed that there's sometimes a big disconnect between what's happening in the large arteries versus what's happening at the microvascular level. And so things like, you know, we use ABIs and these other markers aren't necessarily the best, mar best correlated with what's happening at the microperfusion level. And so, you know, I wonder if one of the things is we, have, we don't have very good therapies, and is it because we're trying kind of one therapy for all approach as opposed to different people may have different problems. Some people may have more of a problem in the pipes. Some people may have more of a problem at the microcirculatory level. And, and maybe the therapies need to be targeted uh, based on kind of the individual phenotype. Mm -hmm. Really good. Any okay. other questions? Any other questions? Well, as always, thank you. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks for giving me that. Excellent.